This is the first conference that makes me feel like Justin Bieber. Do <laughs> right. you see the stage? Just awesome. Um, somebody asked me to mention something uh, before I start the talk. It's very hard to see you all, but it's not important. Um, that's better. Who had uh, barbecue last night? Who noticed the two guys that spent three hours baking meat for us? Candy and uh, Adrian. We, we, I organize a conference myself, and we uh, often forget the volunteers. So I think it's important to, whenever you see somebody in a blue t-shirt, I think they are blue or black. Anybody wearing a t-shirt, just give them a hug. <laughs> Good. Um, so. Um, I'm Wim, and I do absolutely nothing. I actually have proof. This is a t-shirt I got from Duo Security for doing absolutely nothing. I think everybody should do more of absolutely nothing. No. Um, I'm a managing consultant at IO Active. I'm the chairman of the board of IC Squared. Don't hit me for that, no tomatoes. Um, I'm an organizer at Brucon, and I co-developed the penetration testing execution standard. If you're not familiar with it, look that up at pentaststandard.org. And it's basically the, around that time when we started developing that that I um, basically fell in love with threat modeling and was looking into how can I apply that more, work with my clients to um, do more threat modeling, uh, build security into systems from the beginning. Um, everybody knows that threat modeling is very um, known in the software development uh, area. Um, it's all started at Microsoft with Adam Shostak. He wrote... Uh, by now, two books. I think uh, Ian met, uh, mentioned one of the books in his uh, uh, talk just a few hours ago. Um, that's recommended. I can just stop giving my presentation and let you read the book. No, that's not true. Um, I think threat model is something that uh, more people should do. And very important to remember, and I hope we will learn that during the presentation, um, is that we are not limited to software alone. We can also threat model uh, hardware. Uh, we can threat model complex systems. Uh, we can threat model like a car ECU is a little black box. You can still threat model that. What we're going to talk about? Um, I'm first going to go uh, back in history, and I know Halvor uh, yesterday went back to the 80s. I'm going back to uh, 67 uh, later in the presentation. So we're going to look into history. Um, then we're going to see uh, threat modeling computer science. Um, we're going to go through the threat modeling basics, what you can do, which tools you can use uh, to perf perform threat modeling, and then we'll make some um, conclusions. The four key questions uh, that we want to answer when we do tra threat modeling um, is what are we building? We have to know what we, are, what we are building. What can go wrong? And this is where I think it's very important. Um, who does pen testing or anything offensive in security? Okay, keep those hands up. Uh, and who's more into defensive security? So why don't we all work more together um, to build more secure systems? It's awesome fun to break systems. It's even more fun uh, to actually build secure systems. It is true. Um, we have to know what can go wrong. That's thinking with the attacker mindset. Um, what can we also do about what can go wrong? And how good is our anal analysis? Um, why do we do threat modeling? And I, I hope this works. Because we don't want uh, Dave Kennedy coming in to do a pen test and yell this. Sharkeesh, no! <laughs> that was, that's an inside joke. Anyway, um, if you go back to history, uh, and now we're talking about uh, physical items. <laughs> that was, no, it wasn't Dave Kennedy. Um, Anybody, well, anybody know what, what, what is this? Um, when the first car came out, they needed to make it stop. Does anybody know why we have improved um, brakes? Exactly. Brakes are not developed further, and um, technology is not researched further uh, to make cars stop better. It's made to, to make uh, cars go faster. Um, there's some prime examples of thread modeling gone wrong in history. Um, there's the, the Ta Tacoma Narrows Bridge. It was a very nice bridge at the time that it was built. It was the longest bridge in the world. Um, but they didn't take into account uh, the wind in the area where they built it. So when it was finished, 
um, there was a very specific situation where, where there was uh, a lot of wind. It started to vibrate, and after five minutes, it just collapsed. Everybody knows the Hindenburg, very f familiar with that. It was actually a very safe plane, or plane uh, flying thing. Zeppelin, yeah. Um, and it, it was not supposed to break, but it was a very specific si set of uh, situations. Uh, basically, they were late on arrival. Uh, they had to do some very um, fast movements. A cable broke, ripped one of the bags. They actually thought about um, safety issues when they built it. There were several bags of, um, of hydrogen in the Zeppelin uh, to keep it up. And then when they touched uh, the mast, one of the cables gave static, and it basically just caught fire. Some other examples that everybody's probably familiar with, uh, where some kind of threat modeling was done, but very specific situations were not taken into account. Um, the Titanic in Cher Chernobyl. So this made me think when I was looking at these situations, how can we build systems better to make them more secure and actually think about all the things that can go wrong. Um, is everybody familiar with the WEAR report? This is a report that was written in 1970. Uh, it was actually mandated in 67, um, and we're going to go through a, a few details of this report here. So, it, it was supposed to recommend hardware and software safeguards that would set satisfactory protect, protect classified information systems in multi-access resource sharing computer systems. What are we trying to do today? We are more than 40 years later. We are trying to protect multi-access resource sharing computer systems. Basically, what they moved from was, and it doesn't matter what you call it, you can call it cloud, you can call it the internet of things, you can call it uh, ubiquitous computing, and I, I always select difficult words to say so I can mispronounce them. Um, it's basically the systems like they were used then, and the Raspberry Pis, and every, everything that we have now is a computer. Um, they analyzed this, and they came up with what I found was the first documented threat model um, in computer history. This is actually a very awesome, do, awesome design. Do, do you know that Chris Nickerson is in here? No, seriously. So. Remember his talk? He was the maintenance man. They thought about him in 1970. He wasn't even born back then, right? Me neither. Um, so if, if you look at the threats that they documented in 1970, do they sound familiar to you? Is this what we're trying to prevent now? Um, we, we should do more of these drawings, uh, more analysis of uh, computer system that we're trying to build. Um, but they don't need to be perfect. I think that's a very important message. We don't always have to be Batman. It's okay to look like Batman. Like, if I send my, my child to a carnival, he doesn't need to be Batman. He needs to feel um, and think that he's Batman. So this is the concept of a minimum viable product. If you look at the wear report, and I suggest everybody um, reads the wear report, because th those people that don't know history are bound to repeat it. We're talking about minimal viable product. So the WEAR report identified all the issues in 1970. The first, um, no, one, one of the issues that they identified was uh, mem memory corruption and shared memory as an issue. Um, if you look at all, a lot of the exploits are mem memory um, uh, related exploits. The first time that ASLR was actually implemented was in 2001. That is more than 30 years later. Um, and the final implementation was in 2007 when all the major um, OSs supported ASLR. This is actually another example of minimal vi viable products. Um, everybody wants to play a game. We were out last night, and this is actually a picture from last night. I like to use pictures um, that are just related to nothing. Um, we were having fun, we entered the bar, and there was this game, it's just a simple wooden log, you get a hammer and you get nails. You don't need more to have fun. You talk about the least um, product that is valuable for your customer at that time. And another good example of minimal viable product 
is Windows XP. What we've always focused on Windows, Windows XP as the, as the vulnerable um, part of our existence is basically why, why we, we as an industry exist, protecting Windows XP, right? Um, but there's a very important message when you talk about minimal viable product, you learn through shipping. When I, when I talk about learning, to sh uh, le learning through shipping, we as a, as a security community, as a security consultants, always talk about the cost of repairing vulnerabilities in the past. What we forget is that there's also a cost in not shipping a product. If you don't ship a product, you don't make money. So you have to accept that at a certain point, you're going to ship a product that is probably vulnerable, but people will want to pay for it. You're going to make money, and you're going to be able to improve it. And that's how Microsoft went from Windows XP to Windows 7, and now the shit show that's Windows 8.1. Threat modeling, uh, the basics. And this is basically the um, uh, process that I use when I work with clients and do threat modeling. Um, there's two streams. You look at a system uh, holistically. You basically just look at a system, identify all the components. Um, you can use different tools that I will mention later. Um, and you also identify the countermeasures that are in place. And when you look at a system, you don't only look at the software that you're building. You're also looking at the platform that you're building on and the uh, security properties of the hardware that you're building it on, or that it's supposed to run on. Because there are countermeasures there that you can leverage. You, you shouldn't think that, um, for instance, you should build your own crypto. I think that's the worst idea, and we see it a lot. Uh, but there's al always things that you can use in the OS and um, on, on the hardware level that you can leverage there. So identify all the countermeasures. At the same time, you're going to identify the threats when you have a proper diagram or a proper uh, story behind your, um, behind your system. But what's also important is that you identify the threat actors. Because a threat is nothing on its own. You need somebody that basically hits you in the face, leverages the threat. Then you define the threat model and you report. If you do this internally, there's not going to be a final report. Um, you hopefully put this in a loop and make sure that your um, system is better. Again, I stress that if you make a threat model, it doesn't need to be perfect. It needs to be good and understandable, but it doesn't need to be perfect. There's nothing like perfect. First thing you can use, diagramming. Everybody familiar with um, data flow diagrams? Probably so. Um, so there's what, what you basically try to do when you look at a system, and this is in the best case scenario. This is, a let's say, a, com a more complex system. You're going to start diagramming. Um, you have your, um, your actors, which are basically the squares, uh, your different processes, which are the circles, and then the, um, the data source, which are the two lines with text, text in between them. Um, that, that's, for me, the best way to, uh, to look at a system. But sometimes this is not enough. You're going to have um, very small parts of your, um, of your system that you need to analyze further. And for that, what I normally use is a swim lane diagram. So you're going to, this is basically the same diagram at, uh, as I um, draw, drew before. Uh, but this type of diagramming is, for me, easier to look at very specific parts that, uh, that you need to delve further into. The most import important thing about your diagram, when you make a diagram, is that it tells a story. If you can go through your diagram and there are no what, where, who, um, any, any questions left, you can just tell a story from your diagram and basically describe the whole user experience and what happens with your, uh, with your system, then you have a good enough diagram. There will be moments that you cannot use diagramming. Uh, for instance, if you use an external API, um, you don't know what happens inside. You know what you send to it, you, you know what you get back, um, but you don't, you don't have the code and you don't know the whole system um, by yourself. So in that case, uh, what I normally do is work, do workshops with a team um, that are scenario-based. The ideal way to approach that is to think like in a movie. And we actually call that movie plotting scenarios. Uh, you think, what, what is the worst thing that can happen um, in, this, in this application? And again, 
Um, I don't have any uh, Sun Tzu quotes. I have a Voltaire quote. This is very important to remember. Um, you can always build a better diagram, but at a certain point, you have to live with your diagram. And what I suggest there is you also, also record your assumptions. There's always things that you don't know about your system um, that you will have to uh, just assume. Just record those, and as your, as your diagram or as your uh, threat model lives on, um, those assum assumptions are going to be uh, proven true or false. And because you record them, you can, you can track them and then um, take, them, take them out, basically, um, on what you learn further about your system. Once you have built, um, built your diagram or um, basically made a story about your system, the next step you're going to do is identify the threats. And again, there are seven, several ways to do that. Microsoft, um, they suggest uh, Stride. Is everybody familiar with Stride? Hands? Some people are. Um, so Stride is basically just a mnemonic to uh, remember um, the, the, the most common types of, uh, of threats you see. So spoofing basically means pretend to be something or some, someone else in the system. Um, and I think this slide is important, important because it indicates uh, where you find those. If we go back, I'll try to go back if I can. So if you look at this diagram, and I'm very sorry that I don't have a, a whiteboard or anything. Um, so between, for instance, the web browsers and your uh, processes, there are boundaries. Uh, those boundaries are very, very important to remember because uh, they, they are mostly the places where your, vol uh, your threats will, will exist. If we go back to the stride slide. So this indicates uh, spoofing, pretending to be somebody or something else in the system. Um, these, those are usually found in external entities, the squares you saw, um, users or processes, and processes were the circles you saw. Um, tampering, which is basically uh, changing information in the system, uh, that's usually found in data stores, data flows. Those are the lines between the different system, uh, between the different processes and the and the actors, and the data stores, um, or in uh, processes. Repudiation, um, and I always forget what it, what that means. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> um, re uh, repudiation is basically being able within your system to say who did what, when, why. Um, if you can subvert that, you can break a system. So those are usually found uh, in processes. And threats uh, regarding to information disclosure is, well, everybody understands information disclosure. Um, those are usually found in processes, data stores, and data flows. Uh, talking about denial of service, uh, th those are found in processes, data stores, and data flows. And then elevation of privileges, which is the golden source, um, are usually found in, in processes themselves. So this is the point where I have to mention the card game that is called Elevation of Privileges. Uh, it is a free card game that is developed by a Microsoft team. Uh, you can download it, you can cut the cards yourself, and basically with, with your whole team, you can play the game, you make the diagram of your application, um, and you start identifying threats by playing the card game. It's a bit like poker. There are trump cards. Um, it's actually very fun to do, and you should try that, to do that with your, with your different systems. Obviously, Stride is not always enough. It's a very good tool, but it's also limited because it has only the, the, the five threads um, that they list there. So there's another way uh, to ident identify threads, and that's based on attack libraries. Um, everybody's familiar with the uh, OWASP top 10. That's basically an attack library you can use. Um, but there's, you can also make internal checklists. As you threat model, uh, you build a body of knowledge that you document and that you can go to. Um, you'll be able to thread model applications that are similar to previous applications or systems that you have built. Um, but there are also thread models out there from other systems that are similar to your systems that you can leverage. Then the uh, KPEG, I've tried to work with the KPEG. It's a very complex system. It's a very, um, very deep. There is a lot of information there. 
but it's it, it's hard to relate that to a to a threat modeling exercise. Um, I'm much more in favor in, in using Stride and uh, building your own attack li libraries because a lot of the applications and systems that you will build or that you will maintain um, are very similar. So you, using your own uh, attack libraries, uh, I think, is the, the best way to do it. They are very useful if your developer team is not very familiar uh, with attacker strategies. So if you don't have a lot of people that have um, the, the attacker mindset, then it's very, very interesting to um, use attack libraries. Another tool that you can use. And you see that I don't offer one way to do threat modeling. Um, I think threat modeling is about knowing the tools that you can use and apply them in the different situations. Bruce, Bruce Schneier had a nice thing to say about uh, uh, attack trees. And I find them very useful um, when you do threat modeling for, for black box systems. Like if you talk about a car ECU or, um, or a payment um, payment terminal, you don't know a lot about those systems. And analyzing them from, from the to up to the silicon is very expensive. So what you're basically going to do is see um, where are the assets in that thing. If you, if you talk about a payment uh, terminal, for instance, there's going to be keys in there. Um, there's going to be firmware that you can obtain. And you identify those as goals in your attack tree. The, the, those, those assets become what the attacker wants uh, out of your system. That's valuable to the, to the attacker. Um, and then you're going to do step by step an analysis of what, uh, what does an attacker need to do to obtain those assets. Because when they have the, those assets, your system is compromised. Um, I've tried to draw some kind of attack trees. You, you see that, uh, for instance, if you do st step 3.1, 3 you don't only facilitate uh, attack 3, but you can also fac fac facilitate attack 2. What I really like about attack trees is if you build them, build them this way, uh, you ad identify the places in your system uh, that you can protect your ap application or your system um, in the most economic manner. Now, what can you do? The different approaches um, in threat modeling. There's an asset-centric approach, uh, and that is the easiest way to do it for teams that are not very familiar with the um, with, with an with, with attacker mindset. Um, so you're going to identify uh, the most critical assets, what is valuable to you. But an asset, asset is not only what is valuable, valuable to you. You want to protect what's valuable to, you, valuable to you, but you also want to protect uh, what's valuable for the attacker. What, do, does, what does he want to have out of your system? So you're going to identify the assets, and from there, you're going to build uh, your threat model. The other approach is Again, the attacker mindset, an attacker-centric approach. You focus on your threats and your threat, uh, threat actors and build your um, threat model through there. The fourth step, and I believe this is the most important part. For me, it doesn't end when I generate a report. And you will be very disappointed um, when you see a threat modeling report. Everybody expects like a fancy diagram with all like bombs exploding and shit like that doesn't happen. It's basically you create an Excel sheet where you list all your different threats, um, what, the, what their impact is, and how you're going to remediate them. So ident you identify the threats, you document them, and Excel is the best tool ever. I think like 90% 90 90 of the companies in the world still run on Excel. Um, you validate the threats. And with validating the threats, um, you see if they are feasible, and if there are, there are threat actors within your threat model um, that are actually How should I see it? Uh, credible to, um, to use those threats to compromise your systems. And then you have three choices. You can eliminate the threat. You take it away by re-engineering your application or system, um, by building in safeguards. You can mitigate a threat. And with mitigation, you don't take it completely away, but you make it more costly for your attacker um, to, to actually use the threat. And then, and that's very What's the English word? It doesn't come natural to, to security professionals to say, we accept a threat. But at a certain point, and we go back to the concept of minimal vi viable product, there, there is a need to accept a threat. Sometimes it's, um, it's too costly to re re remediate it, and sometimes your users are not asking for it. So why would you want to, um, 
spend money on on mitigating them or even el eliminating them. So apparently I've gone way too fast. Um, conclusions, threat modeling is not rocket science. Um, I'm not the smartest, mar smartest guy in the room. If I am, then I'm probably in, this, in, in the wrong room. Um, so I believe everybody can, can do it, but it's uh, really focused on experience. Um, it's what you know about your systems, about your organization, um, and that, that's why I don't like to do the threat modeling on my own. If I, if I do it with, uh, with clients, I like to work with the teams themselves uh, because they know what's valuable to their company and they know their systems better than I do or than I will, will ever do. Um, models need to be good, reliable, but they don't need to be perfect, like I said before. And it's important to know that it's a cr cross-disciplinary uh, function. So talking about experience, uh, the best way to do it is work with your developers, but also work with your security people, your QA people. Um, I love QA people. Does everybody agree? OK, one. <laughs> um, so QA people know what goes wrong in your system. They, they see that all the time. So developers build functionality. QA people beat the shit out of functionality and see what goes wrong. So they, they, be, they become very valuable in the threat modeling process. Um, so, what you will notice, and when I, when I do threat modeling training, I, I don't have like set exercises that I do with, uh, with, with a client. I work with their own systems. You basically create different groups and people start modeling on the, on, on the whiteboards and on the um, flip charts. And you see that they are familiar with the concepts. Uh, you go through the theory, um, but, but you see that they are familiar with doing this. They, they already have a way to diagram, and it's normally um, everybody in the, in, in the company uh, diagrams uh, in the same way. It's just about stru structuring the, the, the threat modeling. Everybody talks about lean and agile because, you know, we don't need to document anymore, and it's much faster to create vulnerable applications. Um, but threat modeling is about requirements, just as an agile process is. But it's about security requirements. It's about building better quality products, and it's about build it, building resilient products. What you need to do as an organization is build threat modeling explicitly into your engineering culture, uh, both through training, but also through process. You make the process that is also already implicitly there um, explicit, and make it mandatory. If you look at Microsoft, for instance, if there is um, functionality that somebody wants to build into, into a product, uh, they need to come with a thread model before it's even considered uh, to be implemented. And I think a lot of organizations that build software or that build systems um, should implement a process like that that makes thread modeling mandatory. So you start thinking as an attacker and you start building defenses from the start and not have a penetration testing come in and give you a report with 200 uh, cross-site script and a SQL injection uh, vulnerabilities. Let's see. There was something else I wanted to say. Right. Um, what's also important to, um, to know is that threat modeling is not something that you only do when building new systems. Thinking, uh, there, there was a very good presentation, I think, one or two years ago at 44Con by Oli Whitehouse. Um, and I forgot which, I think he's, no, I'm gonna, not gonna mention which company he's with because I don't remember. remember. Um, but he, he provided a uh, methodology to threat modeling existing systems. Um, that's something you can also do. Because threat modeling is about creating the diagrams, creating the story behind your system, um, if you look at, a, at an existing system, you can build it from the ground up. You look at your st uh, standard setup of your um, operating system, uh, then you install the prerequisites for, your, for the system you are building, and you see what changes in the system. Are there extra users created? Those are trust boundaries. If processes run under, under different um, users, there is uh, trust issues. You're gonna see which, uh, which components are installed, and you're gonna build your system further and further and you're actually threat modeling an existing system. So it's not limited to only building new system, systems, it's also applicable to existing systems. 
And in that, in that sense, uh, defense teams can start threat modeling their whole organizations uh, system by system to, to build better defenses. And I think I've said everything that I wanted to say about threat modeling. Are there any questions? Do you have any examples that you could show us of what some of these things look like? That, Do you have any examples that you could show us of, of what an actual threat modeling exercise looks like? Um, so no, normally, does, does anybody have, um, have a flip chart? No, normally I do this uh, in the presentation itself, but I haven't prepared it here. Ah, okay. Okay, no further questions. Then thank you, Wim, for the presentation. Thank you.